One foot in the grave, one foot on the gas. Driving my big Hummer, babe. Drinking well at last, so I know I'm kind of basic. But baby needs a crude like fish need their water and kids need their fast food. I'm a soldier of fortune. I get what I deserve. I'm just another conscript in the petroleum reserves. Thank you, Alan. That's that's fantastic uh, words. Thank you so much. I am home. Just last month, I was asked to present the topic of sustainability to a couple of classes at Sturgeon Bay High School, right here in the city. The combined, combined classes brought about 40 seniors together. And interestingly, the 10 or so who had various sporting events were excused from the sustainability oh. discussion. <laughs> I ran the students through the student version of this app I'm working on called the Sustainability App and found that many had some inklings of sustainability. A few actually knew about it and one or two wanted to do careers in it. The teachers, Seth Wilson and Craig Kekhoffer, have done a tremendous job under I would say challenging conditions. Why challenging? Because these kids go home and their parents may or may not endorse such crazy, shall I say, Walker-esque, Ellen Walker-esque talking about sustainability and saving cities. But others do, and that is why I'm an optimist. Many didn't think that it was really worth the money to spend on anything sustainable. So. Seth Wilson, who teaches shop and science, showed me an impressive collection of things, of shop tools and machines, and this helps the students to really understand how things are made, how much energy, how much time, the kind of materials it takes to actually fabricate a piece of metal into something useful. And he has also managed to put solar panels and a number of sustainable practices in the high school. And up in Fish Creek, Dave Tupa has green walls where they pick a few vegetables for the cafeteria and solar panels on the roof. These teachers are indeed some heroes in our community. I asked the students what concerned them, and they spoke right up, no hesitation. What will we do about running out of resources, said one, especially food? They were aware of climate change, but still struggling with it. In terms of community, they were worried that their families would be okay, especially with all of this talk of terrorism everywhere, even coming here, some parents told their children, up in Fish Creek, possibly frightening. This has a profound effect on a young mind. I'm worried, said one, that my generation won't have any place to go, no job to go to. And there are a few of them that were worried about communism because of the recent television station portraying one of the presidential candidates as a communist. And one said, do those guys that my parents elect know what they're doing? <laughs> One student said, I am worried about everything. And yet another said, I just don't know. What is our view from this bridge? It's about people. What we want. Oh, 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 I want, I want that one over there, the, no, no, the larger one, one more over. Yes, the really big one, longer, fatter, denser, and made of really exotic elements. That's the one I want over there. But at what cost? What, what could be? 
What could be if we considered what cost? What could be? What could we really accomplish if we came together on our decision-making, remembering that this is all about people? How did we get to there from here? We are a species of super consumers. <laughs> but we can progress. We might evolve. We might also envision ourselves not as super consumers, but as citizens of the world, global citizens, even, as, even in especially in a city of 9,500 people. We can become global citizens, sustainable citizens, especially in this city. We, on our blue planet, no longer have this biotic capacity to feed everybody. It's just not possible anymore. And I'm wondering, should we really overwhelm the rest of the systems? But then I realize, newsflash, we kind of are already way down that road. So we are social creatures, and this is a good thing. Because as social creatures, we are also sometimes consensus creatures. We are social democratic creatures. And I'm wondering, are we really ready for the next evolutionary step? What is at stake? What are we doing? Think of our mayor. Think about the vision of this town that is held close to a heart. One asks, dreamer, doer, passive, active, visionary, quixotic, leader, follower, forward, backward, open-minded or closed mind, a team builder, or an elite group developer. Do we move forward, really, or are we staggering, or worse, falling behind? We fall behind when reinvesting in historical approaches, some of which worked well in the past but are not applicable now, are taken on as new ideas. The mayor is the city's chief executive officer, the point of focus, the one we look to as our leader and as holding the city's vision for everyone, for everyone. They must possess the ethical and moral compass to guide us. The mayor has the potential to pow and, and power to inspire. The mayor holds the power of veto. The mayor can be an enlightener and an educator to the possibilities. It is not just a job. This is a huge responsibility, especially in this time of contemplating sustainability, of contemplating what the town will be like 100 years from today. 100 years from today. Can we be the city, the very community, that in 100 years our great-great-grandchildren will be proud of what we accomplished in our day? A future that is seen as better than the moment we are experiencing right now will propel us forward willingly, not kicking and screaming. What influences the sustainability growth of a city? First, the understanding that in the next 30 years, over 80% of the global population, 80% of everybody on the planet will be living in a city. And that includes this city. Cars, cities, traffic, noise, all of this thing has to be dealt with. The cities are the highly populated human ecosystem of the planet. This is an ecosystem we are making. And if we want the ecosystem to survive, we better tend to the nature of it. How many people will live in Sturgeon Bay in 2050? Sustainability. It's an overused word. And some people say that there's no meaning to it anymore because it's so overused, but I find that it is actually very much an important word. It is about people. Sustainability is all about people. Nature does not care that we are on the earth. And believe me, nature has seen a lot worse thrown at it than 7.4 billion human beings. Just ask the dinosaurs. But. It's finding the balance between humans and nature so that we can balance what we use and what nature can provide. Sustainability does not mean unchanging. It means that we as a people can adapt to change and thrive for the long term by providing 
for what needs through responsibility and renewable resources and repurposable practices, sustainable practices. Sustainability is our measure of what we do and what we use towards a good quality of life. This is why it's about people. It's about quality of life. If you have a lousy quality of life, you're probably not being sustainable and there's a lot of other stuff wrong, right? So, I want you to think of sustainability as a sphere. The big sphere is the environment. It is the planet. How well, many of us would have a home if we didn't have a planet to set it on, right? So this is a pretty big sphere. And we use everything humans know to understand how the sphere of the environment works. If you don't know how something works, you will damage it, maybe unknowingly, not out of malice. Inside that sphere is the community <coughs> sphere, the sphere of us, everything that brings human beings together. The city is part of that sphere, and in fact, the city is its own sphere. And inside that sphere is the sphere of the economy. Without the community, you have no economy, and without the environment, you have no community. So, environment, community, economy. So for me, sustainability is a quest. And I learned this by seeing the most beautiful, sustainable cities in the world, and by seeing the utter collapse of cities and civilizations in some of the countries I worked in. But then, it come, then I come home, and I realize we are amazing consumers. Is it possible for us to look beyond the easy and the fast money and consider the whole, the long-term health, rather than the fast money? Is it possible for us not to build something or buy something simply because we can? But pause and think about the implications and the impacts to everybody around us because everybody around us is our neighbor. Would any of our wants change? That is, would our choices and habits as consumers change and our behaviors towards our neighbors improve if we knew that our grandchildren would not have what they need to live. So now, let's remember, cities are the cradles of democracy, the loci of innovation, and the concentration of voices. They are humanity's greatest experiment. They are humanity's ecosystem. And the dominant drivers of environment, community, and economy. Cities will endure. Well, some. Will our small city of three bridges endure? Mayors are really the keystone in global governance through the network of cities and the high population centers therein. Cities are more important because of the number of people living in them than any other place people live on the planet. And the mayors are the closest people to those that constituency. I would pose a question, is the mayor more important than the president? Is the mayor more important than a senator? Well, where do you get most of the stuff done? Could we actually sustain ourselves in this small city of 9,500 people? What if we had to source all of our food and electricity in or near Sturgeon Bay. Could we do it? The knee-jerk reaction is, no way. If we absolutely had to, we'd probably say, I don't know, the math is pretty bad. But I heard in the elections and stuff, this word quite a bit, innovation. Did you guys hear any of that word, innovation? We are an innovative city? I heard that a few times. Pamela Murphy purchased acreage in Northern Door County off of Old Stage Road in 1995, and she and her husband John now manage a 10-acre farm that produces 95% of all the food they eat, all the vegetables, all the fruit, all the dairy, all the meats. How does she do it? In a garden, you'll find over 35 varieties of vegetables, and she's a seasonal cook. Blueberries in January, only if they're frozen not from Peru. 
There is a beehive for honey, sugar maple trees for maple syrup. She has over 100 fruit trees in her orchard. Apples, pears, apricots, palms, persimmons, quince, pawpaws, and medlar. That's funny little rose-hip-like loquat fruit that we like. And the animal farm produces meat and dairy. Milk from Nigerian dwarf goats is used to make cheese, yogurt, soaps, milk, of course, and shampoo. Chickens produce egg, eggs, and some of the chickens go to meat. The geese go to meat, and she also has rabbits. That's meat as well. In the shady backyard spot of her lawn, she has inoculated and soaked a bunch of logs, and the mushrooms are growing there for the stir-fry breakfast. Pam Murphy is an artist and can paint in her gallery between trips to the garden to the animal pens and the fruit orchards. My sister Jean introduced me to this farm. I knew, I've known Pam for a long time, but I had not seen her farm. We went up there last year, and I was just up there last week with a sustainability class from the clearing, and I can tell you, these people were floored. How can you actually grow enough food to eat all year round? If you have any doubt, go see Pam. And here in Sturgeon Bay, consider the vegetables and fruits consumed by the residents of Sturgeon Bay. Well, I went into the grocery store and I did a little bit of research. Very few things are from here. With highly efficient tried and true agricultural methods, and with some hydroponics and greenhouses to get us through the winter, we ca could we really produce enough vegetables right here to feed 9,500 people? People eat on average 685 pounds of vegetables, fruit, dairy, and meats every year. That's 6.5 million pounds of that stuff for 9,500 people. If you want the math, I'll give it to you later. How much space do we need to grow that? Well, it turns out that that requires about 5,310 acres. That's just 8.3 square miles. Now, Sturgeon Bay is plonked down in the middle of agricultural land. Eight miles of agricultural land is nothing. That's easy to come up with, actually. If you co-opt farms, Co-op people like to grow food, maybe like a wife who has an urban garden in the side of the house. I mean, all of these things are possible, you see. So with only eight square miles, we could actually grow all the food, vegetables, fruits, meats, and dairy for this town without importing anything. That means you don't get avocados in the middle of winter because in the greenhouses you can grow avocados. In my house, I have three avocado trees. I have two citrus trees, and because I love coffee, I have 14 coffee trees. And the cherries are ripening on the coffee trees as we speak, and the 14 coffee trees will give me 50 pounds of roasted coffee a year. That's good for about a week for me, but I'll have to make do. <laughs> and we have help. We have help from people like Pam, we have help from the Organic Valley Co-op and the family farms that they have helped reinvigorate in this community and in greater Wisconsin and actually across the country. And we have Wasita Organic Beef. Tom Luzzi, I was just talking to him two days ago, and he is like, you can't just believe how excited he is about, that's a meat cow and it's happy. It's playing with a toy in the field. And look at the lawnmower that's cutting all that grass and stuff. And, and the cows come over and stand at the fence and they stare at the lawnmower because they know the guy on the lawnmower is gonna bring the bucket of grass over and dump it in there for them. It's like a fresh salad. They can't wait for the lawn guy to come by. It's all organic and he says, Margins are tight, margins are tight, we spent a lot of money, but we gotta do it. Somebody has to start somewhere. So the answer to the question of growing all of our own food in Sturgeon Bay is a yes! Plant something. Let's consider energy. Could Sturgeon Bay provide all of its electricity, that is, for its 9,500 residents and approximately 7,075 households that currently have accounts with Sturgeon Bay utilities? I did my homework. 
Well, first of all, let me talk about lead. Chris Kellams told me just a week ago, I want my house to be here in 200 years, and I want it to be energy independent. I just about cried. I mean, wow. She and Dave out on Alabama Street, they're doing it. Lead is leadership in energy and environmental design. It is a voluntary consensus-based certification of using sustainable practices. Enter the lead landscape that Christine and Dave Kellams have innovated in town in Sturgeon Bay. You've read the articles, you've been to the openings, and have you done it yourself yet? There you go, we're coming along. So they, uh, they got a hold of Verge Temi. Uh, I've known Verge a long time, and uh, she's pretty creative. Just keep her on budget. <laughs> keep the city on budget, too, by the way. Well, the Kellams own the small lot over on Alabama Street, and it had an old summer cottage that Dave was telling me about. Nice little place, wasn't winterized, cost an arm, a leg, and uh, two or three cats and dogs to, to pay for uh, the heat in the winter. The couple right here was environmentally aware. Now, the Kellams know about climate change, you know. In fact, I think they know where the state of California is, possibly. and. Uh, they're very open-minded to ways to conserve energy. So they were also associated with the Door County Climate Change Coalition, of which Verge and myself and many others are members. And uh, they were interested in actually becoming better stewards of the planet and actually not talking about it, but putting ideals into practice. This is gutsy. We talk a lot. We do little. The Kellams used local talent. This is really important. This is jobs. So what'd they do? Well, they needed, you know, the electrician and the plumber and the guy that can put solar panels and the, the guy that can put in that cool Scandahoovian heating system and the renibulators and the gizmachos and all those things. And all those people are within about 50 miles of here, most right in the town. One or two came from Green Bay, maybe. That's local. That's local. You're employing locals. You're employing your neighbors. And, and uh, now Chris has a 200 square foot vegetable garden in the front yard. She doesn't have to cut any grass. Yay, there is a little bit in the backyard, but because I am making her feel very guilty about that grass, she will be planting vegetables there soon. <laughs> so I visited the house a while ago with Verge. And that's when I met them, and uh, we talked, and I started suggesting all these more things they were doing, and they said, no, we're already doing that. And I said, oh, well, you should, what if you did this? Oh, we're doing that, too. And how about, yeah, that we're doing that as well. There were a couple things that I came up with that they hadn't quite yet put in, but I'll tell you, you gotta go see this house. This thing just got a 106.5 LEED Platinum certification, which is in the upper 0.1% of houses in the United States. Yeah. And it's in Sturgeon Bay. It's not in San Francisco. It's not in Honolulu where it's easy to live off grid because nobody ever wear get they just go out in their underwear all day. I mean, it's so, so hot. It's not in Florida. It's not in, in Denmark. It's here in our home. Snapshot. Winter, February, power bill, $402.99 in the old cottage. Last February, 67 bucks. No reaction? Nobody wants to save money? Okay, then. Now... In the discussions with sustainability-oriented folk in the community and their new lead home, the Kellams are carrying the banner, you see. And that's what I want all of you to do. Pick up a banner, pick up what you're good at, pick up what you know, pick up what you're interested in, because we need to get this continually, all the time, going, never stopping. This is perpetual motion. This is how we change. This is how we change. 
and those who ran for office last time, I hope will run for office next time, and we will get more and more help for all those people that run. So Chris called up Sturgeon Bay Utilities, because she wouldn't need to hook up to the utilities, because she's going to make extra, and she and Dave are making extra energy that can go actually into the grid. This is a sustainable practice. And the general manager, Jim Stolwicki, said, you're trying to go off grid? The answer should have been, I'm so excited you're trying to go off grid. Now consider Sturgeon Bay. Sturgeon Bay Utilities has a green power option as part of its renewable energy program. You guys, anybody participate in this? I didn't think so because I looked at the statistics. Jim Stolwicki is quoted with saying, through the voluntary use of, volunt through the volunt, let me restrict, through the, v v v v voluntary, through the voluntary use of green energy, could have been sustainable energy, but green, okay. Actually, energy is rarely green. It's all sorts of weird spectral colors. And through the, the, he said, through the voluntary use of renewable energy, everyone can help to preserve limited resources for future generations. But only 2.4% of the SBU customers participate, participate in this. And although this is greater than the, sadly greater than the national average, this is a frighteningly low percentage. In fact, this is what we call in the biz window dressing. This has no impact at all, 2.4%. 10% actually has no impact at all. And you see where I'm going with this. We are behind the eight ball. Sturgeon Bay Utilities has 7,075 paying customers and consumes 52,784 megawatts of electricity, megawatt hours of electricity in 2014 for those people. It's about 12 cents a kilowatt hour. They brought in about $6.4 million. It's a business. Remember the question, could Sturgeon Bay provide all of its own electricity, that is for 9,500 residents and approximately 7,075 SBU customers? So Sturgeon Bay Utilities would require 0 0.06 square miles or 1.8 million square feet of solar photovoltaic panels to give everybody in this town electricity local. That's it. That's it. Even if we doubled it, that area is not prohibitive. Costs? Got to work it out. But guess what? They do it in other places, other northern climates as well. But imagine all of this could be accounted and accommodated for on the south-facing rooftops of every Sturgeon Bay building. I'm not saying there aren't challenges, but I would contend that the biggest challenges are not technological or financial. They are political and social. So the answer to the question is, yes, we can produce all of our own energy. Sturgeon Bay is a young city as cities go, maybe a middle ager in the Midwest, but it's a young city. In 1849, Oliver Perry Graham built a cabin just down the way, and that was only 167 years ago. Graham was far from the first person here, though. That honor goes to the First Nation people, those who followed the melting ice of the Pleistocene Glacier North as the Great Lakes were formed. They found this land void of humans and rich in wildlife and forests. The soil that had been compressed by moccasins has long been plowed. The rock that was polished by ceremonial wonder has been quarried. And the cedar, white pine, sugar maple, hemlock, hickory, ash, and oak that were shelter has been cut. And now we go to the inhospitable vertical face of the Niagara Escarpment to find our oldest Wisconsin forest, where some of the trees are 1,500 years old, too gnarled to make a board. 
Living within one's ecosystem means that we can sustain the life and the community thereof. Like nature uses energy and elements, dy dynamics and opportunities. Ask yourself, do you live in the same ecosystem as your neighbor? Maybe a better way to ask this is, do you live like you are living in a different ecosystem than your neighbor? The conquering of the Door Peninsula occurred much the same as everywhere else people went. Gradually more people, more homes. First jobs were harvesting what nature provided. Fishing, trapping were the early mainstays. Soon, the timber industry. And under the sawmill, the door, Door's virgin forests were hewn, stacked, conveyed to build the town and others down the lake. This place, though, would ultimately be named after its namesake bay, Sturgeon, named after its namesake fish, Sturgeon, the Sturgeon a truly ancient fish, a Triassic aged fish, a similitaceri, coming into being over 235 million years ago. Think of the genetic memory in that one. So, more villages. Graham came Otuma, came Sturgeon Bay. On the other side, Bayview. The canal digging operation in 1873 stretched on for nine years. And the result was Lake Michigan is now connected to Green Bay, and everything north is actually officially an island. To the city's end, the dolomite of the Niagara Escarpment was blasted, hammered, shaped, and crushed into buildings, into stone, and to materials to make miles and miles of roads. And then a steel bridge went up in 1931. The sawmills had done their job all too well because now all the forests were gone. With the Sturgeon Bay Canal and the abundant great shipping, shipbuilding really boomed. And it really took off in World War II because of submarines. And then crops and orchards became the rural occupation, com complementing the city shipbuilding jobs. But the soils are pitifully thin, but they're mineral rich. But now they are tired. And we have to get phosphorus from Canada, Florida, and Mexico, nitrogen from petroleum, and potash from South America so that we can eat corn. When one is trying to survive and nature is plenty, one may not see the forest through the trees. What's the trunk of this tree that we call our civilization? Well. The civilization is actually all that stuff that supplies it, but really it's the super city. And they're enveloping suburban hinterlands. These are centers of human development and innovation. Since the 1800s, we've seen a creative and service components in city outpace all that traditional production stuff. That's why the old economics don't work anymore. Things are different. Ask any economists that have been doing his homework it is really what we're in now is a transformation of our economy, a transformational economy, transformative economy. New rules, new players, younger people, better technologies, open minds. Just four or five, south of, uh, four or five hours south of us, about 240 miles, is a super city. It's our super city. It's Chicago. We are part of Chicago. We are connected by water, by roads. We are connected underground in the groundwater. We are connected in the air by airplanes. We are connected by buses and trains, food, transport, electricity, goods and services. We are part of Chicago. Some of you might think we are more part of Chicago than you want to be. And in between, Kenosha, Racine, Milwaukee, Port Washington, Manitowoc, Two Rivers, Green Bay, and off-trend Apple Valley towns of Appleton, Nina, Menasha, Oshkosh, and Fond du Lac. All of these towns together, how many people are here? 13 million. That's a lot of people. If you journey through all these towns to get here, you'll go over 143 bridges. Sturgeon Bay's mayor won the 2016 election by 54 votes. 52? I stand corrected. 
Thad Birmingham just pulled ahead of Laurel for the three-year term, which I think will go quick. I know how Laurel feels. I lost my Egg Harbor re-election by 10 votes to the County Board of Supervisors. And yes, I got a lot of bad press. But what of that split vote? Remember, 52 votes between two ideologies. How does one heal that rift? Laurel Brooks, the runner-up, said, most people yearn for a unified city. All it takes is mutual will to meet a ground, common ground, reach across the fracture and start building a bridge. We should be good at that since we live in a small city with three bridges. Thad Birmingham, the winner, said, there are a lot of opportunities out there. The potential of Sturgeon Bay is barely tapped. What if we could combine ideology? There is truth in both. The one, healing and moving forward, is needed first. The other, the potential, maybe a little bit vaguely worded, but it's in there. A rift widens as opposing forces pull apart terra firma in the terra firma in between. In politics, this terra firma is trust. As that trust falters, as ears are closed, as name calling escalates, as judgment is passed on constituents, we all fall into blindness. This is a future blindness. We get nothing done. It's all very personal, and I quite frankly hate the phrase, it's only business, it's not personal. How many of you spend most of your waking hours working? That's personal. How many love your jobs and still spend most of your waking hours working? That's personal. Business is always personal. You might make hard decisions that fire people or make people miserable, but that is still personal. It is never just business. And the mayor or the businessman that forgets this will fail. So this century, and we're not that far into it, started with possibility, but catastrophe and incogitability rained down. I was in Green Bay in the Kavarna Cafe having breakfast when it happened. A buzz started, everybody was talking, and then I got a call on my cell phone. Someone has attacked New York City, 9-11. September 11th, five years after the attack, I would be standing at ground zero. Ground zero was a hole in the ground, a great rectangular void, many stories deep, that had been the foundation for 20% of New York City's office space. It used to hold a unique community, an ecosystem, if you will, that held a special vibrancy to the city. It was a mecca for business. It was a gathering place for international sphere of people who came to New York. It was a place where men and women would go to work and they had pictures of their sons and daughters and wives and husbands on their desk. The bubble of the United States of America changed forever that day and it changed Sturgeon Bay too. It added a different kind of fear to the political and social dialogue. We became fearful of change and longed for the days of simpler threats. But did those days actually really exist? Were you really feeling more comfortable worrying about an atomic bomb than a terrorist with a bomb in his socks? Our country and communities within hunched shoulders. Many of us musicians in Door County participated in the benefit concert on 4 September 11th at the Third Avenue Playhouse just a month after that disaster. And a year later, I'm marching in the worldwide rally for peace. In Sturgeon Bay along Madison Avenue, Madison Street, excuse me, sometimes I get cities mixed up. There we gathered about 100 people in the cold overcast day under a light snow flurry. 
On one side of the street, people carried signs reading, Give Peace a Chance, Stop the War Machine, Drop Bush, Not Bombs, No Blood for Oil. You do not bomb a country into democracy. The world will not be ambushed. And on the other side of the street, veterans from VFW Post 3088 gathered and held up signs, support our troops, freedom from fear. Freedom is not free. Do we wait for another Pearl Harbor or September 11th? Is the message really different, though? Commander Don Zingrabe of the 3088th told me, we're not rooting for war, but sometimes you have to make a choice of freedom or war. And he pointed across the street at the line of the other people carrying signs. We went and put our lives on the line so they could do that. And I asked the commander if we would go to war. Oh, yes. And they'll have to issue the GIs a bunch of brooms to sweep up what's left of that country, Iraq. The stuff we have now is so sophisticated. What about the civilians, I asked. There are no civilians in Baghdad. Is a civilian a civilian when he makes ammo and guns? And I think of all the Americans that make ammos and guns and are indeed civilians. Some of the peace marchers expressed their dismay at the 3088's viewpoint. Laurel Brooks said, it's the first time I've seen a counter protest. But every sign I see over there, we all agree with. We support our troops. It's not about supporting our troops. It's about not going to war. I was standing next to John Hippensteel with his children in the cold wind on Madison Street, and his daughter Sally hugged a teddy bear. And the teddy bear was holding a sign, Bears Against War. And John said, this is a great turning point. Our planet is reaching a point where we have got to get away from war and solve our problems otherwise. But the citizenry began experiencing many a cantankerous parties uprising amid the status quo. All corners of the cube spun off into their own non-synchronous orbits, now and then causing collisions and having a then underrated, but now as we know, thunderous consequence in the various parties of our nation. And in all these campaigns, hope came to the surface. And we bring that home here from the fomenting diatribes to the articulated truths, from the bray of beliefs to the discourse of science, from the emotion to logic. We are besieged with a continuum of information and opinion, and this, in whatever state of disjointedness it may arrive, and in whatever state we are in, to be able to take it on. Well, the point is, we receive all this information. We receive too much information, and we're not always really sure what's fact and fiction. We live in a strange time. Last year's issue of National Geographic in March was headlined, The War on Science. Climate change does not exist. Evolution never happened. Moon landing was fake. Vaccinations lead to autism. Genetically modified food is bad. Pretty much pick your poison, right? How are our policymakers supposed to proceed with all this disarrayed information? If an elected official draws upon their constituency's belief in facts and well-documented happenings, we get one result. But if they are led by opinion and fear, then we get another result. What is our city going to choose to do? It's kind of up to you to keep after these guys. And you have to go to every meeting. You can't miss one. You can't miss one. This is a place of ships. When I work for WBDK 96.7 FM on your rail, or if it's an electronic device otherwise, your, your buttons, Roger Utenheimer said, go out and find stories. I wrote 100 stories on Sturgeon Bay for the radio and 200 stories for the Peninsula Pulse. I talked to just about everybody. I couldn't get enough of you guys. 
Everybody's got this fantastic story to tell. The ship captains on the thousand footers would say, who the hell are you? I'm from the radio station. What do you want? I want to do a story on you and your ship and what it's like on the water. Oh, well, all right then. <laughs> and we would walk the whole length under every single deck and I got to see every single oily joint and piston and deck and bump my head so many times that look at me, I've lost all my hair. <laughs> we got bay shipbuilding. Tugs, offshore support vessels, double-hauled tankers, and barges. And uh, there's another town just down the coast here, Manitowoc, who built a bunch of subs in World War II. And so when the Manitowoc Corporation shipyards closed and the operations there, and they purchased Sturgeon Bay Shipping, Shipbuilding and Christie Corp, they were combined in 1967 to make Bay Shipbuilding. And since 1885, and with six different ship companies, this town here has built 540 ships. That's astonishing. That's something to brag about. That's called PR. And there's the winter layup with the big ships. The Masabi Miner, James R. Barker, American Courage, the Lee A. Tregurtha, all three 1,004 feet long. I've been on all of them, on every single deck, and used the loo as well, as they say, the head. So now we have the U.S. Coast Guard Ice Cutter Mobile Bay cleaning out the bay so these ships can get around, right? But what's happening to the lake? There's less ice. There's less ice. The only reasons the ships come here is because the Sioux locks ice up. Ask any captain of those freighters from 500 to 1,004 feet long. When the Sioux locks do not ice up, the ships will not have to stop in Sturgeon Bay. This is global warming. This place of water, Sturgeon Bay, an artery connecting Green Bay with Lake Michigan. The Great Lakes all together hold nearly 21% of the world's surface fresh water. 21%. 21% of the world's surface fresh water. This is a non-renewable resource. Our climate cannot refill this lake if we drink it dry. And in case you had any doubt about it, there are 200 million people who are really thirsty looking at it. There seems to be a trend. The optimistic, involved, responsible person runs for an office. There are dreams of what can be done and what should be done. But time weathers dreams just as it does a hull that's a wreck on the rocks. The so-called old boys network becomes ensconced. One starts to hear, that's how we do it around here, in this town, in this county. I was told by a county board member to mind my own business, and I was a constituent. I ran for office. Thank you, Tom Tarinas, Frank, Stan Frank Stanizek, and Ellen Walker, who I can't say gently pushed me in. I think all three of them used both feet, both hands, lots of guilt trips, and there we went. And I joined others in trying to stop the building of a justice center. Why would I do that? Because in the land deal that I investigated, in the building I looked at the designs, there was poor judgment. There was shady budgeting going on. Documents were misplaced, never to be found again. And I was made a villain. I was made a villain for finding these things. I also didn't want my home to have a jail as a business. An advocate for the jail screamed at me during a county board meeting. We can fill up the empty beds with criminals from Appleton and Milwaukee. 
What are we building here, a bed and breakfast? Really? You want to have a jail business? Well, we don't have enough prisoners to build the jail, so we'll have to bring them in. Oh, why don't we just refurbish the one we have? And most of those problems are not violent and actually need significant social addressing. So I went to the jail and I asked the sheriff, who's in the jail every weekend? Well, you get the son, the father, and the grandfather. If the Packers lost, they all beat their wives. And we get the son, the father, and the grandfather. They're all in jail because they're drunk and driving because the Packers won. You don't build a new jail for this. You sit these gentlemen down and say, look at grow up. Let's start working with you. What are your problems? What can we help you with to modify behaviors for nonviolent criminals? So we founded the Justice Coalition. I fought for this thing. It was resisted, but we got it. And I wanted to be chairman of this thing. And I was not allowed to be. They appointed a former colonel. And we all sat around the table. And the colonel looked at each and every one of us. And he said, I've been to 50 countries more than anybody I've seen war. You don't know what you're talking about. We'll do this my way. That is a quote. I wrote it in my journal. This committee would slowly be run aground, and the political storms would weather it down to its bones, and the jail was built. I lost. Did we miss an opportunity? Yes. We missed a huge, community-changing opportunity. Oh, there are many social programs, and they are key to improving people's lives. We need these programs more than we need jails. And in 2004, we missed a huge opportunity. So in 100 years, what will be the citizens of Sturgeon Bay saying about what we did? What is our sense of place? The population of Sturgeon Bay hovers at around 9,500 people. Door County, 28,000 plus or minus, depending on if the guy that just retired up here and moved here had ever been through a winter. Very often they get up here and they say, why aren't all the restaurants open in the middle of January? And how come nobody's around? And have you ever been here other than the three weeks in July? No, why would I? Well, okay, <laughs> and their house is up for sale in the spring and they're gone. So the other 28,000 are the people that stay, some of which have families that have been here for generations and generations and generations. I was born in Madison. I was born in Wisconsin. And I was told, oh, you'll never be from Door County. <laughs> so I understand that. But it's home. I have a house here. My sister lives here. My niece, my nephew, my mom. We live here. My dad is buried here. Annually, we get about two million visitors. About a million of them actually detour through town. Now, I understand why they're working on that bridge right now because they want people to go through town. I think, I'm predicting, the highway department will keep that bridge project going until well into the fall <laughs> because all these shops need a lot of people coming in. Uh, you guys think so? Yeah, I know. It's not so inconvenient, really, except I almost drove off at one dark night before I knew that it was open or closed. So this has a huge impact to the town. They come from all over. They drift down 3rd Avenue. And how will Sturgeon Bay be impacted by an increasing global population? And what is driving this change that we're also facing? Climate change, jobs, food, water, safety, security, a constant search for a high quality of life. But the numbers are sobering. I mean, we have 7.4 billion people in the world right now. And by 2050, we're going to have 9.6 billion people in the world. 35% more mouths to feed and, do the math, 
We need 70% more agricultural space to grow food for these people. Now, remember that little thing earlier on where I said we could grow our own food here? That's looking pretty good, isn't it? You want to buy an avocado for 14 bucks? How about getting on a plane and flying someplace, maybe let's say Seattle to see a friend for $15,000? Just wait. I am an economic geologist. I make up numbers as good as any of them. <laughs> 9.6 billion people. 70% more agricultural capacity is needed. By 2025, it is estimated that globally, 1.8 billion people will be living in some place that has little or no fresh water. Now, where do we live next to again? What's this big thing out here? Great, help me out. What is this? Great, say it loud, I can't hear it. What? No, what, great. It's the Great Lake, for crying out loud. And guess what? If you live in Arizona and California and Nevada, if you live in the South, you're looking at that like a jewel in the crown, and you're the thief, and you're going to go up, and you're going to steal it because you are dying of thirst. You haven't had a good tomato since you can't remember when. You're trying to plant grass in Arizona, for crying out loud. And actually, you come up here and you go, wow. The Garden of Eden. We sit on the Great Lake of Lake Michigan. We sit in a county of agriculture. We sit in a city of ships. We sit in a city of veterans. We sit in a community of families and students and farmers and skilled workers. We have a lot of open space. Our population density in Sturgeon Bay is only 762 people per square mile. Chicago's population density is 18,500 people per square mile. That's the future, folks. Crowded cities, and here we have the Garden of Eden. Only 58 people per square mile in the county. Think of it. Water, land, Space, food, equals, let me say it again. Water, land, space, food, equals, and people. It means if you don't do sustainability or if you do do it, you're still going to get the people. The dry states to the south and west, the breadbasket states, too hot to grow corn anymore. The coastal states that will suffer from sea level rise and inundation. We've seen these migrations before. Early last century, the hurricanes in Louisiana brought forth the population to the south side of Chicago to do jobs. That's when they moved up here. Their homes were washed away. But here in Sturgeon Bay, climate change is giving us something that's a bit of a miracle. Climate change is natural, although humans have accelerated it you know, something that was supposed to take 10,000 years, we did it in 150. We are catalysts. So what's it going to be like? Well, guess what? It's good news. We get about 40 days more a year growing season, more food. We get plenty of rain. It's going to be hotter. So the evaporation lakes uh, rates on Lake Michigan will make that water level go down, but we got a few more hundred years on that. Uh, so we have land, we've got water, uh, we have rain, and we have space, and uh, we have a megacity just a few hours south of us. Consider some of the numbers, and Lake Michigan is looking pretty attractive. So I did some math. There are a whole bunch of studies on migration rates because of climate change, and the numbers vary from 8% 8 to 25% 8 increase in city size. I'm just going to give you the upside number because you can take off as much as you want. If we go all the way up, we're looking at 50 to 70,000 more people this century in Door County as residents. And in this city, we could go from 15 to 20 to 25,000 people. In Sturgeon Bay, where are we going to put them? Hopefully not in a big box on the shore. Are we ready for the next wave? We have to welcome them, just about like all of us are immigrants, except for those First Nation people. 
In a meeting with city administrator Josh Van Lieshout, Christine Kellams asked him, what do you want Sturgeon Bay to look like in 50 years? Do you remember asking him that? Now, I just talked to Josh yesterday and confirmed what he told you. No one has ever asked me that question, he said. Really? Have you ever asked yourselves that question? This is a key question because Josh is quoted as saying in the city council meeting regarding the waterfront, we will be committed to a waterfront park and public promenade along the bay with converting a blighted and underused property into a new one. But does that mean, I ask, a new hotel? Does that mean, I ask, a large, often empty structure that does not fit with the sense of place of Sturgeon Bay and its legacy of ships and water, shorelines, smaller scale architecture, and people that like places, people were like to go to these places. In a public meeting here in town last year, Dan Collins, a friend of mine, so full disclosure there, one of my environmental heroes, a concerned citizen, I want efforts to develop a vibrant public waterfront in Sturgeon Bay and to ensure a more inclusive and citizen-driven vision for Sturgeon Bay's future, right? This is why Chris Kellum's question she proffered to the city administrator about the future of Sturgeon Bay is so critical. The Kellums keep in touch with Sturgeon Bay City Council Alderpersons Kelly Caterzoli of District 1, Will Gregory of District 7, who have visions of sustainability, but they need your help. This takes a lot to get your arms around. They need you. They need you. So here's a call out to city alderpersons Ron Vandertai, District 2, Ed Ireland, District 3, Rich Wisner, District 4, Jerry Stoltz, District 5, Stuart Fett, District 6, and Mayor Thad Birmingham. All people that could be heroes to future generations or not. And a reminder that we have enough buildings that are too big. We have enough buildings that are architecturally inappropriate. We have a few too many developments that block the shoreline and access by the citizenry. We have too many buildings that are underutilized or standing empty from the majority of the year, in some cases all year. And we are losing our young people to other towns. And we are importing our food from distant shores. And we are mining and pumping our energy and not seeking out more of the sun. And we are, well, I think you get the message. There are always people who can list the reasons why something won't work or isn't possible. But we are innovators. And if you don't think you are, open your mind and start to think about what you could do. Just showing up at a meeting is a big step. We are innovators. In fact, innovate. Seek innovation. There's no high horse. There's no smooth sailing. There's no straight road as we traverse this into the future. What do we want our city to be like in 100 years? What will its sense of place be? What will the grandchildren sing about? Who will the future city leaders quote when recognizing great accomplishments, wisdom, foresight, and innovation? Who will they quote? Please go to the city meetings and ask that question. Will it be you, the elected officials, any here? Will it be you, the citizens? We are mostly a white city with a little bit of color. That's going to change. We are an aging pen peninsula population, and that's going to change. We are a community of great economic stratification, and that must change. And we are a community that is in danger of losing its identity, and that must not change. Sustainability. The sphere of the environment, the sphere of the community, the sphere of the economy. And we need to be heroes, courageous, brave, noble qualities, outstanding achievements. We need our elected officials to be heroes. Now, please, you are not alone. 
You have thousands of people to help you. Please accept this help and go to your elected officials and go to your friends and as far as your arms can reach and as far as your mind can imagine, you have help. I love this city. I really do. We saved the steel bridge, this city. So I'd love Pat McDonald to write a new song saying, we saved this city. Thanks very much. What next, Ellen? Depends on you. Um, if you need to leave, feel free. If you don't mind taking questions, not at all. Feel free to stay. I you have some handouts here we'll about. Throw you out. I have some handouts here about advice to mayors from other mayors around the country in sustainable cities. Please pick one of those up. I have some uh, thing on carbon fee and dividend, uh, which was originated with the. Uh, Sanders Bachman uh, bill, and uh, uh, Bob will hold those up. And I have another thing over here about what are sustainability cities. Please pick up copies if you're short. And if you'd like, I can put this text on my Facebook page, Roger Coons' Sustainability Worlds, if my niece Mary Beth will help me figure out how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? And books. Uh, the last move, by the way, I just want to say, uh, there we go. <laughs> I put the kid to sleep. Um, I was I got married and I uh, a couple years ago and I was moving some stuff. Oh yep, I was moving some stuff from here to Connecticut where she has a house, and I thought this would be three days of boring driving and I was actually really looking forward to it because it's all been very busy, and uh, it was anything but got stopped by the cops and they pulled civil forfeiture on me in Indiana. I was in Cleveland during the Republican first debate and it was the night John Stewart had his last show. And then I had lunch in Sandy Hook two days later. So this is that story. It's only 10 bucks, pays for gas because I'm still not. Well, I don't own a car, gave one up eight years ago, but to get up here I had to rent one. So there you go. What is your plans for the scarf coming out? This fall, the first half is at the editors. Start. Tell us the question. Oh, yes. Uh, the question is, when is my escarpment book coming out? This is a book on the natural history of eastern Wisconsin from Milwaukee to Washington Island starting at 4.55 billion years ago and going 200 years into the future. And it's a collection of stories that, about what we see and how we know this stuff and what's going to happen. And uh, in great vivid detail, some experiences like some of the Mount St. Helens eruptions where I lost some friends and uh, finding dinosaurs and uh, stuff like that, as well as climate change and how we figured that out. So I've been doing a lot of research here over the years and um, uh, the research with my class that I teach uh, every now and then down at the Cedarburg Bog was the first class to actually find the bottom of the bog and document climate change since the ice left. So that kind of stuff is in there. It's a, lot, it's a fun read and it's not highly technical, it'll be for everybody. And I'm only two years behind. <laughs> but there's a couple other books too. There's Didn't See That Coming, which is what Alan was kind of referring to early on about uh, wandering around the world and Kind of learning about sustainability by actually watching it work or not. Oh, yes. Yeah. So just a brief point. I'm not a geologist, but I remember studying the Niagara Escarpment, departed over New York by Niagara Falls, yep. the way it's eroding. So you hear about the Dolomite being the protective layer, and then the erosion that happens underneath the fall, the way it's, it's slowly inching its way backward. I moved to Door County, started coming up here four years ago, moved here a year ago, and I'm like, where's the Dolomite? So you had mentioned, I believe in your presentation, that it was crumpled up and basically harvested and used for roadways. Is that there's, there's 52 quarries in Door County. Uh, about a third of them are gravel from the glacial outwash and the rest are crushing up rock. And those are in the Dolomite. Uh, the one in Peninsula Park, 
the one just up at the end of the road here and a couple other up the way were actually on the escarpment itself because you could load barges. You could just blast them off and put them on the barge and sail them into town or down to someplace else. The escarpment, uh, and you're sitting next to another expert of it there, uh, Bob Boltman, uh, the escarpment is uh, heavily impacted in Door County, and uh, that's because uh, a lot of the home building on it and a lot of the treatment of that forest on it were impacted before it was fully appreciated. So we are trying to protect the rest of it up here uh, rather vigorously. And it's here. There's some beautiful places. All of it has been impacted, but some of it has recovered. Okay? Is there any relation between the, 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 the removal of the dolomite and this karst? Uh, not, no. Not a job? Okay. No, the karst, the karst is... Uh, millions of years of rain dissolving the rock away and making, it's kind of like we're living on Swiss cheese. It's full of holes, you get a cave, it caves in, makes a sinkhole, and the farmers, when I was a kid, uh, we'd come up to, Merrill, uh, to uh, 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 the Sandstrom's up in, uh, on Water's End Road, and uh, one of the farmers, I uh, heard him telling Maureen, I was, I, I don't know, what we were, five, six, seven, something like that, uh, oh yeah, what I do, because when these things open up, if I got an old refrigerator, I don't need that goes right in there. <laughs> you know, I got a car in one of them. Uh, if we get a dead cow, that goes in there too. But oh boy, the water tastes bad for a few weeks after that. Kids need so. their fast food. I'm a soldier of fortune. I get what I deserve. I'm just another conscript in the petroleum reserve. Now I pump it out of Texas, drain that salt dome too. I'll pump it from the Saudi sands if you really want me to. Oh, I'm a consumer of the world, babe, an economic whiz.